So, so I, decided I decided to go to, go to Princeton. Princeton. Now, now Princeton, Princeton had a certain aspect of elegance. It was, it was an imitation of English school, partly. partly. So the guys in the fraternity who knew my rather rough, rough informal manner started making remarks like, like wait till they, they find out who they've got, got coming to Princeton. Princeton. So the very afternoon I arrived in Princeton, I'm going to the Dean's Tea, tea and I didn't, I didn't even know what a tea was or why. I had no social abilities whatsoever. I had no experience with this sort of thing. It's all very formal, and I'm thinking about where to sit down and should I sit next to this girl or not, and how I should behave when I hear her voice behind me. Would you like cream or lemon in your tea, Mr. Feynman? It's Miss Eisenhower. I'll have both, thank you, I say when suddenly I hear her laughing. Surely you're joking. Once during philosophy class, we were asked to write a theme on what had been taught all that year. But the only thing that I could remember was a moment when there came this upwelling. Mugga wugga wugga stream of consciousness, mugga wugga wugga. And then, foom, it sank back into chaos. The stream of consciousness reminded me of a problem my father had given to me when I was a boy. He said, suppose some Martians came down to Earth, and Martians never slept, but instead were perpetually active. Suppose they didn't have this crazy phenomenon that we have called sleep. Suppose they ask you the question, how does it feel to go to sleep? What happens when you go to sleep? Do your thoughts suddenly stop, or do they move less and less rapidly? How does the mind actually turn off? I got interested and decided to watch my sleep. Take four. The vastness of the heavens stretches my imagination. Stuck on this carousel, my little eye can catch one million year old light. A vast pattern of which I was a part. Perhaps my stuff was belched from some forgotten star as one is belching there. It does not do harm to the mystery to know a little bit about it. Far more marvelous is the truth than any artist of the past imagined. To those who do not know mathematics, it is difficult to get across the real feeling as to the beauty, the deepest beauty of nature. If you want to learn about nature, to appreciate nature, it is necessary to understand the language that she speaks in, and that language is beauty, and that language is physics. Take two. I studied at MIT and received a doctorate from Princeton in 1942. I developed a new approach to quantum mechanics simply by using the principle of least action. The wave model of electromagnetics of Maxwell. I replaced it. I worked on the atom bomb. I was appointed the chair of theoretical physics at Cornell and Caltech. But it wasn't always like this. I started small. But I was always experimenting, always testing, always deducting. My knowledge grew as my passion grew. And once I got my foot in the door, it snowballed and evolved. As a child, I dreamed of teaching. And as a student, I dreamed of lecturing. I don't believe I can really do without teaching. The reason is, I, I have to do something, so when I don't have any ideas and I'm not getting anywhere, I can say to myself, at least I'm living, at least I'm doing something. I'm making some contribution. It's just psychological. I often have this dream. I'm running. I'm being chased by someone unknown to me. But I feel the presence there all the time. Maybe it's society, maybe regressed anger towards my father. Or maybe every unsolved or an unsolvable problem has entered my head and been stuck there ever since. We have a habit in writing articles published in scientific journals to make the work as finished as possible, to cover up all the tracks, to not worry about the blind alleys, or describe how you had the wrong idea first, and so on. So there isn't any place to publish in a dignified manner what you actually did in order to get the work done. You can't let society get in the way of your goals, and you can't let anything stop you from finding the answer, the truth. During my years of the Manhattan Project, I passed my time by figuring out how to pick locks on filing cabinets that contained classified information. I took nothing. I merely left notes to let the officials know of the flaws in their security system.
I am Richard Feynman, a Nobel Prize winner in physics, a best-selling author, and a member of the Presidential Commission that investigated the Challenger disaster. I will die on a Monday night in Los Angeles at the age of 69. An eight-year battle with abdominal cancer will finally destroy me on February 15, 1988, but I will continue to work and learn until that day. I was born not knowing and had only a little time to change that here and there.